one of the most infamous cases of cameras in the courtroom occurred in Texas. Television was an infant. Cameras, blinding lights, and cables everywhere resulted in the 1965 U.S. Supreme Court overturning the conviction of Billy Saul Estes. The ruling stated in part, there is no First Amendment right for cameras in the courtrooms and that cameras must be banned from courtrooms in many instances because of their adverse effects on the judicial process. Almost a media riot with multiple, uh, multiple cameras, uh, uh, reporters obviously, uh, just, just uh, a, a large, large interest in this case. You know, the press, in, in a sense, uh, didn't discipline itself. Ironically, in 1973, a sketch artist at the trial of the Gainesville 8 anti-war activists became the catalyst for the current camera rule. CBS had been held in contempt for broadcasting the sketches. The attorney for CBS was Sandy D. Allenbert. So we overturned a, a, a court order by a federal district judge. And when we did that, we began to think about the opposite side of this. Uh, if sketch artist uh, activities are not distracting to the, uh, uh, to, to the trial process, then we ought to be able to, uh, to change the rules totally uh, banning cameras. Next came a petition by the two Post Newsweek stations of Florida and their attorney, Sandy D. Allenbert, to the Florida Supreme Court. Thanks to two forward-thinking justices, Alan Sunberg and Arthur England, a one-year experiment was conducted in courtrooms across the state. The results were stunning. A vast number of judges who had never had cameras in the courtroom were very much against cameras. The judges who had had cameras in the courtroom were for it. The trial participants uh, had no objection, no distraction. On May 1st, 1979, the experiment became standard operating procedure. A series of very high-profile cases being televised became the norm, so that by the time a Florida case reached the U.S. Supreme Court in 1979, evidence proved the Saul Estes decision was wrong. If we had been wrong and the Florida Supreme Court had been wrong, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Supreme Court would have been faced with uh, overturning an awful lot of cases. And I think they were probably not inclined to do that. This openness is the envy of other states, says Pat Roberts, president of the Florida Association of Broadcasters. They look at us as the model for cameras in the courtroom. Um, and so I think especially uh, the news media, the television radio stations, and even the newspapers are envious of how open we are here in the state. And uh, other states would like to be that open. Fast forward to the 2000 election, where courtroom dramas from Miami-Dade to Tallahassee unfolded in the nation's living rooms from coast to coast. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye! Stories of bias and political affiliation dominated the airwaves as the case headed for the Florida Supreme Court. The implications were not lost on then-Chief Justice Charles Wells. It was very important to put down that type of of, of the concern uh, to and equally that we were going about this in a legal way and not a political way. And I thought that by having uh, question and answers during oral argument really helped us in, in getting that out to the public. The court also took the unusual step of authorizing its spokesman to do something that had never been done before speak for the court before a national television audience. The court today has issued its opinion in the case of Albert Gore Jr. The cameras, though, were, were the, the most crucial role. If you saw uh, the arguments here at the court, and certainly the, in the days after uh, the arguments, we heard this from many commentators, you did not see a court here asking partisan questions. They were asking purely legal questions. And uh, that so impressed members of Congress that they even urged the U.S. Supreme Court uh, to try to uh, uh, do something similar uh, when the arguments went to Washington. It was this unprecedented openness that led to a rather dramatic development. Florida broadcasters filed a petition with the U.S. Supreme Court asking to have cameras present during the arguments of Bush v. Gore. It was denied within hours. But then the phone rang. 
I got on the phone and it was the public information officer for the United States Supreme Court who told me um, that Chief Justice Rehnquist had reconvened the justices uh, and I would be receiving a letter by fax and they had reconsidered and that we would not be allowed to have cameras in the court but we would be allowed to have the audio tapes and I said the audio tapes and they said yes. The rest is history. The openness in Florida moved another court to do something new. Cameras are still banned from the U.S. Supreme Court, but for how long? When will there be a case so big that they will consider that again? I don't know. Um, and maybe it's my fault that I haven't gone back and petitioned the new court uh, with Chief Justice Roberts that they might even be more open to it today. And the future of cameras in the court is not being written here in Florida but in The Hague, where war criminals face trials halfway across the continent from their homes. For those courts to operate, they think it's extremely important that there be transparency about their proceedings, and they achieve that uh, through this incredibly good use of, of uh, modern technology, cameras, and webcasting. There's no telling where technology will go next, but there's also no question that cameras have given the public a far more accurate understanding of court proceedings than could have ever been achieved by a sketch artist.